Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to our Forest Fire and People webinar series brought to you by Colorado State University's Center for Collaborative Conservation and the Institute for Science and Policy. I am Kristen Uhlenbrock. I am your co-host for this series and the director of the Institute for Science and Policy. It's my great pleasure to be joining you this night. I see people joining us from all over the state of Colorado, as well as California and Nebraska and beyond our borders. Before we get started tonight, I do want to acknowledge with respect that I and our guest reside on the traditional lands of 48 Native American tribes who now live throughout the American Southwest, the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountain region including the Southern Ute, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Apache, the Comanche, and the Shoshone tribes. Tonight's episode is number two in this series, and we're gonna be focusing on the historic fires of 2020 in Colorado. What made 2020 so historic was absolutely the sheer size of all of these fires we had. Collectively, over 600,000 acres burned in Colorado last year, including three of the largest wildfires in Colorado's history. Lives and homes were lost, and our hearts go out to anyone who is directly impacted by last year's fires. As we'll be hearing about today, the impacts are not only upstream where the fires took place, but also downstream. Wildfires do impact all of us. We do have a top notch lineup of guest speakers tonight. who are gonna share a lot of great insights about what happened in 2020. It's provide a little bit of view of what maybe to expect in upcoming future fire seasons, including this year. But let me go ahead and bring my co-host and partner into this conversation, John Sanderson, who's the director of the Center for Collaborative Conservation. Good evening, John, how are you tonight? Hey, Kristen, doing well, thank you. Great to have you. John, why don't you go ahead and continue on introducing our guests and providing a little more context for tonight's episode. All right, thanks so much. And thanks to all of you who have chosen to spend an hour of your evening with us. In today's episode, we will build on the foundation we created last week with tonight's guests helping us understand last year's fires. Much of our conversation today will focus on the Cameron Peak Fire, which was the big one just west of Fort Collins. At nearly 209,000 acres, that's more than 325,000 square miles, Cameron Peak is the largest fire on record in Colorado. But although we will be focusing a lot of attention on this fire, the insights from this fire apply broadly across the West. Next Monday on April 5th, we'll discuss the human dimensions of fire, including the so-called wildland urban interface, which is sometimes referred to as the WUI, and other aspects of living with fire uh, next week. And then on April 12th, in two weeks, we'll be talking uh, with three additional experts on the future of Western wildfires. Before introducing this evening's guests, Kristen and I want to acknowledge and thank the Gates Family Foundation for their financial support of this series. And we also want to uh, thank our partners at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network, the Colorado State Forest Service, and the Climate Adaptation Partnership. All these organizations helped us put this together, including focusing the content and recruiting guests and suggesting guests and so forth. And speaking of guests, our guests tonight are, are, our guests tonight are Russ Schumacher, Monty Williams, and Jen Kovexis. Russ serves as the Colorado State Climatologist, and he's the director of the Colorado Climate Center. In addition to his responsibilities as faculty, faculty here at Colorado State University, where he teaches and does research. Russ's research interests include weather analysis and forecasting, extreme events, and societal impacts of weather and climate. Russ received the Clarence uh, Leroy Meisinger Early Career Research Award from the American Meteorological Society just in the last few months. So congratulations, Russ, and welcome. Thanks so much, John. Glad to be here. Our next guest is Monty Williams. He, uh, Monty is the forest supervisor for the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forests and the Pawnee National Grassland, where he works for the US Forest Service. Prior to this role, Monty worked with Congress on issues critical to the Forest Service mission. Monty brings a breadth of experience and passion for multi-use land management 
having worked in a, on a variety of national forests across the U.S. Thanks for joining us, Monty. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite tonight. Looking forward to it. And Jen has lived in Colorado for the last decade, uh, and now she currently serves as the executive director of the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. Jen has led a career focused on aquatic ecosystems and has worked on a variety of watershed conservation projects across North America. She has tremendous expertise in managing post-fire restoration projects, which you will hear in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Jen, uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks for the invite, John. I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right, welcome all three of you. We're gonna start this evening with each of our guests um, taking about five minutes to share a few key perspectives on the fires of 2020. Russ, let's start with you to share some of uh, some key points about weather and climate. Great, so yeah, I'll try to set the stage a bit for getting into the um, into what what happened in more detail with the fire that, that Monty and Jen will share, uh, but to try and set the stage a little bit for what what we saw in terms of weather and climate last summer that um, that that led things to the situation that we ended up in, um, and I'll show a few uh, graphs here and that that hopefully will we'll drive home uh, some of that point as to, to what we saw and, and kind of where it stands historically. And so I'll start off here, I guess I can first direct you on the right to the, the map in the lower right. The star there is the location of this weather station at, at Grand Lake, uh, just outside Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, that, that was right within, ended up right within the East Troublesome Fire, which is shaded there in the red, and then the Cameron Peak Fire just to the north. And just for orientation, you can see Fort Collins and Denver there on the map um, as well. And so what we see, we, we like make, looking at these, uh, these quadrant charts and because they give us a lot of information in a, in a single, uh, single graph. So on the, on the x-axis on the bottom is precipitation. And then on the y-axis is temperature. And so the way we've plotted it here, basically, if you're up in the upper left, it's warm and dry, which is not where you want to be in, with respect to drought. If you're in the upper right, it's warm and wet. Lower right is cool and wet. Lower left is cool and dry. And so this is for one weather station at Grand Lake, which was, was again, right where the East Troublesome Fire uh, occurred in October. And this, this covers the period from July 1st through October 21st, which is when that when the fire swept through there. Um, and so all the various years from that weather station are plotted on here. Um, and we see 2020, I've tried to highlight with the star there way up in the upper left. And so at this, at this location, it was um, by far the driest over this particular period in the, in the late summer and fall. Um, and, and what's interesting, if we look in, in these higher elevation stations in Colorado, what we often see is a pretty narrow range of precipitation. So if you kind of look at the graph there, you know, pretty much every year sits somewhere between four and 10 inches of rain over this period with an average of about seven. And so not, not very frequent big variations. This, these look different if you look out like on the Eastern Plains where you have some years that are just extremely wet and some years that are extremely dry. It's, it's generally a narrower range up in the mountains. Um, but in any case, what we see from 2020 was, was way up in the, in the warm and dry quadrant. Um, and so about a six inch deficit in rainfall from July 1st up until when the, when the fire came through there, which is you know a couple inches drier than the previous driest year, which was just the year before in 2019. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And this now zooms out to all of Western Colorado um, and focuses here just on the month of August, which was, was when the most extreme conditions happened and, and kind of set the stage for uh, what we saw with the, with the wildfire season. So again, this is averaged over all of Western Colorado and you see 2020 way, way up in the upper left, far beyond both. It, it was the, the hottest August on record for Western Colorado by by about two degrees over warmer than any previous August. Um, and then, and also the driest uh, August on record for that part of the state. 
Um, so again, um, August is the time in Western Colorado when we expect the North American monsoon to um, bring in, you know, at least somewhat frequent rain and cloudiness and more humidity that, that all kind of work to keep the temperature down, but we didn't see any of that in 2020. Um, and it, and it, you know, things heated, heated up and, and dried out very quickly. So you can go to the next slide. And we'll kind of now look at things um, from the, the longer term perspective here, sort of where, where we are. Um, and this, this graph is now Colorado statewide. Um, and it's one metric of drought. There are a lot of different ways you can look at drought um, data, but this is one that we use a lot. It's called the standardized precipitation index. And essentially it's just, it's just uh, a measure of how unusually wet or dry or, or not uh, it is in terms of precipitation. And here we're using 48 month time period. So this is like long-term you know, multiple year kind of drought situations. And so if we go back to, to when we have um, reliable data across the state back to the late 1800s, you can see some of the, so here are the, the brown colors, uh, less than zero um, are the, the dry periods and the green are, are the wet. Um, but in any case, we can see some of the, the historic droughts uh, over the last you know, century plus in, in the region, the, the drought just after the turn of the, of, the, um, of the 20th century, and then the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, and then the 1950s, and the, um, the drought of the, the late 1970s, especially in the mountains, um, and then kind of a wet period through the 80s and 90s, and then our three more recent droughts since 2000, the one in 2002 into 2003, and then 2012, and then at the far right, the, the one that we're currently in. And so if we look at it from this perspective, the, the having three droughts within 20 years is not, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat more frequent than we see historically from this precipitation perspective, but, but not that different from what we saw maybe in the, in the 50s and 60s. And kind of the lack of precipitation is, is, is certainly notable, but kind of ranks up there, not more extreme than, um, than the other ones. But what we're going to look at now is what happens when we also account for the effects of rising temperature and a warmer atmosphere, all else being equal, a warmer atmosphere, especially in the summer, is, is thirstier. Uh, it's more efficient at, at taking water out of the soil, the vegetation, the forests, um, et cetera. And so if you go to the next slide, we see what this same graph looks like when we account for the temperature in this way in now what's known as SPEI, the Standardized Precipitation Evapotranspiration Index. So it tries to account for the evaporation part or the evapotranspiration part, that thirst of the atmosphere. Um, and so now it's a pretty different picture over the last 20 years where we see that it's essentially one long dry period with, um, you know, with three kind of extremely dry periods in there. Um, and so now, you know, you see that 2002 uh, period being kind of the most extreme, uh, uh, and that was, of course, a, a huge fire year as well, and then 2012, and then the ongoing drought, but really with no wet periods interspersed there. So when we were looking at just precipitation, it wasn't that unusual historically, but this is what we're kind of looking at as the climate warms is, is we get into to what's been termed by others as hot drought, where the, the precipitation deficits aren't um, historic. They're, you know, it's dry, but not historically so. But when you add in the, the effects of the temperature, um, everything is, is drying out here in the West um, in, in that manner. So I think I will stop there and uh, turn it over to our next presenter. Great. Hi, Monty Williams. Uh, you know, it's it, it's interesting with what Russ was talking about when I was uh, first starting out um, and that district, normally we didn't see snow come off the around the ranger station until somewhere in late April or early May. And then one year we had a fire that started in early March and nobody could remember a fire actually burning in early March, more or less with the fire behavior. And we thought that was an anomaly in the 90s. And um, uh, over time, since that time, it's no longer an anomaly. And of course, in that area um, in Idaho that I started, we were seeing a lot more fires. 
But um, let me hop in. I, I, I thought that was really fascinating and surely su definitely supports uh, kind of uh, some of the things that I'm going to chat about. I've spent about half of my career as a professional hydrologist with the Forest Service. And during that time, a lot of my efforts went to evaluating the impacts of wildfire and dealing with floods and erosion that happened afterwards. Today, I wanna to talk a little bit about what conditions made the time right for the fires we saw last year. I'll focus on Cameron Peak Fire, which became the largest wildfire in Colorado's history. We, also, we, we all knew um, that this fire was gonna happen someday up there. I'll show you some of the work we completed in years past that was designed to stop a large fire like Cameron Peak. And you'll also see what happened when it ran into it. So we've got the first slide up here. And, and what you see, these are the last year's large wildfires. And I actually say four of the five largest wildfires in Colorado history. Because if you look at the top, the Mullen Fire, which was primarily in Wyoming, actually slopped down and, and, and was um, in the state of Colorado in a small amount. And uh, three of the five largest fires in, in Colorado history burned on my forest at some point last year. So uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit of area when you think about the state of Colorado as a whole. Can you go to the next slide, please? I'm gonna focus on the area uh, that's shown by the box. And although it's probably hard to read the names, uh, but uh, that, that's the upper front range of Colorado. And so uh, this area is, is the fire shed for the Cameron Peak fire. And it's, it's huge. It goes from Wyoming all the way down to Estes Park. And it goes from the Continental Divide all the way to Fort Collins. I, I think the point is of this, and, and I think this really makes this, this uh, point well, is that when we're starting to talk about what do we do with fires like this, is there anything that we can do about them? You're talking a huge area. That is a huge area. Can I go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> uh, back one, there we go, perfect. So, uh, should be the trees, there we go. So all the trees, all the brush, even the needles you'll walk on on the forest floor are all fuel for wildfires. And, and I, you've seen, many of you have seen uh, photos like this before. This is off my national forest. But uh, you look at 1896 and you don't see a whole bunch of trees out there. You see some, but, but not anything like the photo taking almost in the same spot and at the same direction as the, as the photo in the right-hand side. <clears throat> you add the weather conditions that we saw this year that Russ described, and all of a sudden you now have the recipe for disaster because on the left-hand side, that's a landscape that can handle fire. And even if fire hits it, it's not running and gunning like what you see on the right-hand side. That's continuous. There are tons of fuels that you see standing, but also tons of fuels on the ground. And I would say that if, as you look at Cameron Peak, particularly where it started, lodgepole pine uh, were, were thick in there. And starting about the time this photo was taken, we started getting a bug epidemic that killed a large number of the trees in there. So we had a lot of standing dead that was, uh, uh, ready to be burned. So next slide, please. Okay, this, this perspective, we zoomed into kind of the fire, the, the Cameron Peak area, and actually the, the, the movie that I'll show here in a second is of the same area. But I wanted to point something out. Even in this fire shed, we'd already had some fires, and that's the High Park fire that's really big up there. Bobcats is the next biggest one that's a little further south. Um, next slide, please. And work was started about 15 years ago, recognizing that, hey, there's going to be fires. Um, and we sh what could we do about them? And I, at that time, really didn't have a lot of thoughts about how it was all going to work and, and such. But, um, but they started working on, um, on prescribed fires and, and, and other types of thinning and things to give us a shot at stopping the fire. But about five years ago, a group of partners formed the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative. And it's a grassroots or or organization that's stepping up efforts to make a difference with wildfire. That green stripe was our strategy. And we need to hold on the video. Yeah, green stripe is our strategy. And, that, and what we're doing is constructing a one to three mile wide area from the Wyoming border all the way down south of the park where tree density is reduced and where prescribed fire has been used to consume other fuels. It, it kind of makes it look what that left hand side of the photo did this year a few minutes ago. Wildfires usually burn west to east here. And so by stopping the fire at the stripe, we wanted to minimize the ability to, to continue to grow, uh, the fire to continue to grow. We wanted to reduce the impact of the communities that are directly east of here. And we wanted to avoid dam damage to more wildlife habit, habitat, more drinking water, et cetera. This wasn't the final strategy. It just is what we could do and get started with, and then we would go from there. Um, 
so the next slice uh, is actually already up and there we go. Hold off on the video. The, the, the turquoise blobs are the work that we'd actually got done in that stripe. And so those are, work, those are areas that have been thinned and burned. And then we also, as you notice, took advantage of the high park fire as part of our strategy. So um, what we'll see in the movie here in just a second is uh, the video of the Cameron Peak fire as it burned last year. The, the, the little bright red dots at the left-hand side is the beginnings of that prescribed fire. And so it made two runs at the strategic work that we did and, uh, and, and then a third run. And those two runs, you'll see what happens. It, it, the work that we did stopped it. But where we hadn't done work, that's where it blew out. It doubled in size. And, and most of the homes that burned were, were in that last run. So if you could start the video. Oh, go back one. That's uh, the flood. There we go. Start that one. Thank you. I'm so complicated. So here's the fire. And what you'll notice up in the right-hand corner is the dates. And, and it's it, you're not seeing much growth. And this is very typical. It's still sunny. It's still hot. But the, the, the wind and the, and, the, and the heat and the, and the direction of the topography and all that stuff's not lining up. But we come up fairly soon to the Labor Day run. And all of that, all that aligns. And you'll see the fire more than double. Folks thought the snowstorm stopped it. It actually hit the fire areas up here. And there it goes about two hours before the snow hit and it was effectively stopped before the snow hit. Here starts the second run. It's actually burning up in a canyon there and it's gonna sit here for a little bit and then make a run towards Red Feather Lakes. And then the same thing, a series of prescribed burns and other work up there, we caught that fire again in the same spot. And so this fire sat on the landscape um, for a long time, not doing much. But then as we got into mid-October, as we, we had another run and what you're gonna see it do is, is pop out on the bottom. We had a project planned in there, um, but we, we had not got started on it yet. It, we were just finishing the analysis and we'd hoped that, that that project would stop this run right here. And you'll notice it actually runs into that Bobcat fire and kind of stops. And of course the firefighters use that. So it's a real interesting uh, video, I think, because what you're seeing both is the movement of a large fire across the landscape. And, and a lot of this landscape looks like a whole bunch of the West, but where we work strategically and put treatments in place that, that made sense and were designed to do something, they worked. And where we didn't, it, it pooched out and, and, and hopped out on this other side. So um, what made that possible was this, this fire shed collaborative and and Jen Kubexix who's getting on I always make her blush because she is the she is the ramrod of that of, of our group our collaborative and really works with the community this is a grassroots effort where we work with the community to, to, to do things that make sense and work together both on forest service on on private lands on state on whatever's there that we need to, to develop that that strategy and so with that um, I'm going to hand it over to Jen thank you Great. Well, thank you for that. that those were both great uh, foundations for what I'm going to talk about and hopefully for a really good conversation with the audience. Um, so what I'd like to focus on right now for the first couple of minutes is really just talking about why, why do we worry about these wildfires? Um, what are those impacts that we are concerned about? And what does it look like for our communities moving forward to deal with those impacts? So you know, when wildfires like this happen, the attention out of the gate is always on when the fire is active, when the flames are going, when communities are evacuating, there's a lot of attention on those dramatic moments. But from the perspective of a watershed, and you can start that video now, um, from the perspective of a watershed, it's really when the flames go out that the problems really start to happen. So, so why is that? We've already heard a little bit today from Monty that wildfires are a natural part of our ecosystems in the Rocky Mountain West. We have forests that are called fire adapted forests and ecosystems. So why do we have these big concerns? And it's really tied to how water moves through a watershed and how the patterns of our wildfires have changed. So in an unburned watershed, most of the water in the water cycle of the watershed isn't what you see in a river or a creek. Most of the water either slowly sinks into the ground or as Russ alluded to earlier, it evapotranspirates first through the plants and then into the atmosphere. 
It's that organic layer at the forest floor created by our forests that creates like a watershed sponge basically and allows water to slowly infiltrate into the ground. So when we have these really big, large footprint, high intensity, really hot fires, the difference is that spongy layer gets burnt up and there's no more vegetation or very much less vegetation to pull water into the atmosphere. And so the net result of that in these high severity burn areas is that you have way more volume of water moving over the surface of the slopes and the forest. And that excess volume of water moves at a higher velocity, has more energy in it. And as it's moving, more of that water is moving over the slopes, it's gonna pull all of that ash, sediment, debris, fallen trees, rocks down the slopes and drives it into receiving waters and whatever is in its path. So what you see here in this video is a video that was taken after the High Park fire. Um, so in 2012, the High Park fire happened at the time it was the largest wildfire in Larimer County's history. And this type of event where we got black water coming down the drainage happened pretty much any time we had a large rain event or even a moderate sized rain event in the watershed over the burn area. Um, we'd get these types of events, we'd see this black water it would interrupt or damage and destroy um, important transportation corridors and all of that material eventually made its way into the pooter itself. So these are some of the, like it's just one example of um, what our concerns are moving forward. These types of impacts, the degree and extent of, the, of these types of impacts after a large wildfire can vary greatly and really depend on a lot of different factors. And I'm happy to answer questions about what those factors are. We don't know yet what all of the impacts or the degree and extent of the impacts will be from the Cameron Peak Fire. We're waiting for that first um, set of rainstorm events to happen to, to see what that will look like. But um, we've been working very closely with many people to try and understand and predict what those impacts will be. So why does this matter? A watershed like the Cash Lapooter watershed, which is you know, pretty similar to many of the watershed's headwaters across um, Colorado and throughout the West, our headwater, forested headwaters, support a wide array of really critical watershed values. So even if you live like hundreds of miles downstream from these burn events, it touches your day-to-day -day life. The Cash Lapooter water Shed supports drinking water for over 300,000 people. It supports irrigation water for at least 200,000 irrigated acres directly or fully, or in part or um, partially or fully. Um, this watershed also supplies the industrial water for a really important um, chip manufacturing industry locally and a really important brewing industry, in addition to a multi million dollar recreational industry the Arapaho Roosevelt that Monty manages is the third or fourth most visited national forest in the country. We have a really important whitewater industry and really important recreational fishing industry. The Cash Lapooter is also the only wild and scenic river designated in the state of Colorado. So there's a lot of values that are at risk and put at risk from these types of events. And these types of post-fire impacts we know from other wildfires in Colorado and across the West can last anywhere from three years like to more than 10 years. So it's not a small change in our landscape. And when you combine the footprint of the High Park fire with the footprint of the Cameron Peak fire, that's a huge amount of our landscape and our watershed that has radically changed in the past 10 years. Given that degree of the, the size, the sheer size of the Cameron Peak footprint, the number of land um, owner, the different land ownership, the different cross jurisdictional issues, the number of different um, government agencies that have different jurisdictions in, in or downstream from that footprint. Dealing with the recovery from this type of event takes a lot of collaboration. It takes a lot of work to bring all of those different agencies together and really think through strategically, thoughtfully, prioritizing all of the needs over 200,000 acres, we can't treat every single burn, piece of burn acreage in the burn footprint. We have to make choices. And so we work really 
um, carefully together to use the best available science to plan and prioritize those needs. Um, and one last thing that I wanna leave with you just that's specific or maybe a little bit unique about the Cameron Peak fire and some of the other fires that happened in 2020. Um, I've already mentioned the importance of this watershed for our drinking water supply, but the Cameron Peak fire with the extent of uh, its facial, spatial footprint and where it fell on that landscape, not only did it burn around the Poudre and the Big Thompson watershed itself, so the rivers that we that supplied directly raw water for drinking water for about 50% of the needs of both Greeley and Fort Collins, but it also encompassed five, at least five of the most important water storage reservoirs in our watershed. So the, the ripple on compounding effects of this type of event on our water supply is particularly concerning for our local municipal water suppliers. When you couple that, that uh, the redundancy in our water supply comes from the Big Thompson, Colorado Big Thompson, that was affected by the East Troublesome Fire in 2020 as well. Um, we're in a situation where there's a, there's a lot of concern about what, what this means for um, how well our watersheds can continue to support um, water supply without risk um, moving forward. So there's a lot of work going into trying to mitigate those impacts. And I think I'll just leave it there and um, open the floor for any questions about that. Great. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Monty. Thank you, Russ. Wow, we have both complementary and diverse perspectives. And, and Jen, I definitely think we're going to get back into some of this recovery, right? Where are we right now from 2020? But I, I bet there's a lot of um, thoughts on people's minds about this upcoming fire season. Um, so let me start with Russ with this question, um, because it's, let's just get it out of the way. What are we looking like for the upcoming fire season? That one graph you showed has that pretty deep extended red territory, right, of both drought and temperature, and that pretty deep and like down in there kind of, we're not coming out of this anytime soon. So what are we looking like with our current snowpack, our current soil moisture? What does the upcoming season look like from your perspective and, and, and beyond, but definitely this upcoming year, this upcoming fire season? Yeah, so for, I think for the fire situation specifically, it's, it's probably still a little bit too early to say for sure. There's a lot of things that can happen between now and, you know, and the summer. Um, but, but that being said, we're, you know, we're in most places, we're not going into it in great shape. Um, right. The soils were very dry after last summer, the snowpack has gotten back up to closer to average in most places in, in Colorado, um, from some storms here in, in February and March, but, um, but the, the kind of the drought certainly persists and, the outlooks for the spring and summer don't look great. It looks til you know, odds tilted towards warm and dry. Um, you know, so here along the northern front range, we had this massive snowstorm a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, um, and there was a lot of moisture there, and that has helped a lot, kind of in our specific area, you know, where we are here in the Denver, Fort Collins, and the in the mountains west of us. Um, but if you go further west, they didn't get nearly as much snow from, from those. Um, and last summer was even more extreme in those areas. And so, you know, if we, if we look at the, say the US drought monitor map right now, it still looks very bad um, once you get kind of west of the immediate, um, the immediate front range here. So um, I might leave the, the kind of specific fire aspects to, to Monty, but it's not, um, you know, it's certainly, is not exactly where we want to be going into a summer, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that could happen between now and and June that that could mitigate that. Um, uh, but it's that's not what the outlooks are pointing to at this point. Monty, did you want to add on to that? Like, what? How? What's your view of this upcoming season? Sure. You know, one one of the things that was fascinating about last year and terrifying all at the same time was uh, we still had active fire. Um, Thanksgiving week. And, and if, if the fire teams had not been able to put that out at that point, uh, we, that may have drawn clear into January. And, and, and I'm not sure we would have ever seen anything like that. What was happening was the big heavy fuels. So stuff that's the logs, you know, that are, that are standing or laying down on the ground. Um, 
they they came into to, to the when the fire started drier than the timber that you buy at Home Depot. It was that dry. And um, it takes a long time for moisture to be in contact with that wood for it to get wet again and not want to burn as well. And, and, and when it dries out, we have a measurement, it's called uh, energy release component, ERC. And when it gets up above around the 97th percentile in their way of calculating it, then you got all sorts of crazy behavior. Well, we kept having those high numbers all through the year. And, and even in different times, as, you know, Labor Day, we had a ton of snow, it melted. That didn't do anything for those big logs. Many of our big runs, as you saw in my slideshow, came after that point. And so really, this is, a, this is a game of how long do we get moisture that will slowly soak into those logs and make them wetter and wetter and get them uh, where they don't burn and don't burn with the explosive energy that they did that year. So I don't know where our heavies are at right now, but what I've been hearing, they haven't recovered as, as much as we would like to. And then another thing that happened last year is where, where did the monsoons go? And so normally we, we start to warm up and we start to dry out and all that happens. But then we get a period where, you know, there's clouds and there's rainstorms and all of that. And it, it's, it's not as hot. It's not as dry and maybe even adding moisture to the system. And so we get a break in the middle of the summer. And then it really takes a while for the fires to take off steam. And not last year, it just built and built and built until August. So it really, in my mind, is two things. I, I'm listening to Russ very carefully because he's forsaging what the summer looks like, but it's gonna depend upon, uh, do we keep getting moisture or does it dry out and we lose what we've gotten with the recent storms, but also are those monsoons coming and, and what are they gonna do when they're here? And they, they'll make all the difference in the world in terms of what our, our fire outlook looks like later in the summer. Thank you, Monty. Um, so you made the point earlier, and both you and Russ have made the point that the, the wildfires that we experienced are a combination of weather and fuels, right? And I want to ask you a bit about um, the 20th century forest management that you referred to in your slideshow. But before I get there, um, I noticed something else about that green line. Um, that you showed, and you described it as the place where we can realistically and strategically build barriers um, to fire that's moving from the west. And last week, we also heard um, from uh, Camille Stephen Ruman about um, the different types of forests. And it looks to me like that line kind of um, straddles the transition between the higher elevation forests and the lower elevation forests. Can you speak to that a little bit and the, and the meaningfulness of that? Oh, yeah. There oh, we clicked the wrong one. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's one of those that um, as you start to unpack it, you, you, you think you got a croissant layer and you're gonna tease that out and then you realize there's a whole bunch of more croissant, croissant layers in that one layer and that you, you hit upon a number of things. Um, so first and foremost, I would say this, that line um, is a line that is uh, the combination of a lot of folks putting their brains around and saying, what work, you know, they're thinking like, okay, what if it was a 2020 and this fire was roaring, where would we have the best place to make a stand? And where do we invest first? Because like I say, there's a lot of work that needs to go in that watershed that later next steps may, be, may have been, and although we're evaluating now where we're gonna go in the future, maybe going more up the center of the canyon as well and making kind of a cross just instead of a stripe to break down even more of the landscape into a smaller area. Each of those types of strategies are really specific to the site that you're in. And, and, it and, you, and you nailed it, it takes in, what are your values at risk? What are you trying to protect? Where do you have a chance to do something? Where do you think you've got the ability actually to get in there and treat? If you've got a whole bunch of homeowners that are just saying there's no way in heck and I'm never gonna do anything here and you need to treat on their property to be able to make it work, well, maybe we step back to a different location. You're absolutely right in terms of where it was picked in terms of the forest type. It's the montane forest with ponderosa pine. And one of the things that if you look at how ponderosa pine interacts with fire, which is different than the west of there, which is a lodgepole pine, is it loves fire and fires in there every so many years. And it's a place actually, once you build something like that stripe, 
you can maintain it in that state. And so now it's, it's kind of a permanent edifice with a minimal amount of effort in terms of just continuing to burn it and keep it in a, in a lower density state. The lodgepole pine just to the west of there, it, it doesn't burn that way. It burns more catastrophically. It goes up all at once. Um, and so it's, it's a harder place to try to create something that creates a barrier for fire. So, so good, good question and good points in terms of why that place was picked. John, if I could, if I could just add to, to that, when, when Monty referenced the Northern Colorado Fireshed Collaborative during his actual talk, that's really that, that collaborative effort to take, like to do that strategic planning and really bring in those cross-jurisdictional elements to think strategically about how we get those treatments on the ground, how do we use the best available science to make those picks, but then how do we work with our agencies and our communities to think beyond the defensible space bubble? Like how do we bring communities into that process of planning and um, getting more community buy-in for this type of work so that we really are planning where the work needs to happen and not just where we have permission from the federal government to work. Um, and that process takes a long time to bring those communities along that, that gravy train of decision-making. Um, so we're typically like a couple years out between when we start planning these, these cross-jurisdictional um, larger treatment areas in that ribbon area um, to when we actually implement. And it's kind of why we didn't get to that when Monty referenced that one treatment area that we were working on, Forest Service had big project area on the federal side and a bunch of the partners, CPRW, for Stewards Guild, we had a bunch of work lined up adjacent on the private land side, but we were so close, but we just didn't, we didn't get there to implementation before this fire happened. I think we need like three hours tonight. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> um, and I, I, I know John and I want to talk a little bit about kind of, um, you know, past management and, and what are we doing nowadays that's different and what can we be doing better? So some of that strategic thinking that um, you both are talking about here. Um, but I wanna actually start and, and pivot us into this just a little bit, which is the WUI, the Wildland Urban Interface that John mentioned. Um, I think it's uh, what I read earlier, there's about 46 million residences according to FEMA, and this is across the US, not Colorado, right? That are located in the WUI, the, the interface between our, our urban where we live not Denver urban, where, where houses are and the wildland interface. Um, this number continues to grow, right? People, where are we seeing growth? We are seeing growth, you know, in these areas, definitely in Colorado, as well as other parts of the West. Um, this is a really important component to how we think about managing wildfires currently, jurisdiction that you're talking about, Jen, and how do we do some prevention? Um, so I want to ask all three of you, but um, maybe I'll start um, with Monty a little bit here, which is, you know, should people be rebuilding and building in these areas, um, knowing that wildfires are a natural part of our environment, right? And you have your work cut out for you for doing some of this management. But what should we be thinking about as a society and as individuals? Um, and I understand people lost homes and this is really personal for people. So this is a hard question. Um, so feel free to, to, to take that as you will. Um, and, and Jen, I want you to chime in after Monty because you, you have a new way of, of talking about the WUI that I want you to share too. But let's start with Monty on this. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of interesting things. You know, the WUI was a concept and an idea that came out, you know, 15 years ago or so. And this idea that maybe, you know, as we look across the landscape and what do we do about this, where do we prioritize our efforts? And then do we do something different in there? And, um, and, and I, I, so I, I'll make two arguments. Uh, first, first one is, is that I think our concept of WUI has changed uh, and I'll explain that in a second. And so I'm not sure in, in, in ways that we've traditionally used WUI, whether it's as effective a way of talking about fire treatments. But the second part is then um, tied to the first in this idea that WUI is something special, at least if you think about the places in and around homes. And, and you can't forget about that place in lieu of, 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 of the other thing I'm gonna talk about. And so the thing I wanted to mention is Cameron Peak, 17 miles one day. How far away from a house do you need to be to say that the fire's right next to the house? Is one day's worth of burning close enough? 
these troublesome burnt over the top of the Continental Divide and made a run at, at Estes Park, all in one burn period. How far away do you need to be uh, from, from a home to say now you're in the wooey? So if you look at the kind of more traditional uh, definition of wooey and say, well, it's that place that's kind of close. Boy, I'm not sure how far you got to be away to not be close to, to homes now. So, but, but with that, I think you have to think about, so separating that from a definition standpoint and thinking about houses and such that way, but you thinking about the area around homes. I believe that if you're, if you're going to make a choice, I'm, I'm not going to advise anybody to not to or to, to live out in the woods. I certainly, that's the place I want to be all the time myself. Um, but, it, but what I'm going to say is, is that it's not as simple, I don't think anymore, of just going around your house and looking and saying, what do I do here? I think as you look at where, where homes burn, the ability to um, have um, type one, our, our best firefighters be able to shelter in place and stay in those sites as the fire bowls boils over, often made some of the biggest differences to whether homes were standing or not. There's a lot of discussion. This gets really into a complex discussion, but the, what it means, I think, in the end, if I just were to get it into a single point, is that as a neighborhood, you need to look at what you got going on and, and you need to do some work to make sure not only you've reduced the risk if a big fire, just as we might look at it at the landscape level, but also do you have the ability, is it safe enough actually to hold fire crews in there as that fire is burning over. And that's gonna take a lot of work in terms of talking with your local fire departments and building strategies that, that, that are legit. So on that bad day, people can hang and, and, and maybe pr protect your house. So I'll stop there. Yeah, and Kristen, just to add to that. Uh, so two things uh, at the most immediate. I, I think of it almost, and we generally in our group talk about, you know, there's there's like the planning Russian doll, right? And the, the smallest, more central part of that is where communities or homeowners have the most agency. And that's immediately around their house or immediately in their communities. They There's a lot of um, both responsibility and agency for people to, to do work to protect themselves from fire in that space. And that's traditionally where we've really focused this wooey conversation is in that space. But Monty's right, like our the current trends in our in our wildfires, that that's not enough to provide protection to that that space. So that's why you know we're working at that next sort of you know the the neighborhood to the subwatershed to the full landscape kind of layer, so that we can bring more of those layers of um, protection to all sorts of watershed values, including communities, um, community wildfire protection plans historically have focused in that innermost space. And what we're trying to do with the fire shed planning is reach across those lines and really trying to pull and link those types of planning together so that as local volunteer fire departments and their individual homeowners are focusing on those near space stuff, we're building out from that with our planning um, and integrating across that. Uh, I think one of the, the conversations that has been changing in, in the wildfire and forest and fire community is, is just this notion of wooey in the first place. Um, the focus historically has been on those, the structures that the residential structures that are in the, in the forest that are close to where we would expect fires to happen. But as I alluded to earlier, we have so many assets and infrastructure just interwoven throughout all of our watersheds. So how do you really separate WUI from you know, the water supply infrastructure or for the recreational infrastructure or our transportation infrastructure? And if you really look at the WUI from the perspective of what's at risk from these wildfires, the definition of WUI can change radically. So there's, there's an ongoing conversation that has been shaping up in that in our community for a little while now about whether we need to rethink the wooey not just from a like you shouldn't have you know, you know wood shingles on your roof kind of perspective but like what does it really mean for us to be so dependent on these headwater areas and how do we really plan and adapt to those risks thank you Thank you, Jen. Um, so just a little plug for next week. Uh, one of our speakers next week it has been working with the Jemez Pueblo down in New Mexico and is going to speak to 500 years 
of living with fire in the wooey. So I think that's going to be a super fascinating perspective. I, uh, you know, what you and Mon Monty and Jen, what you're saying is, you know, one of one of our audience members commented that, you know, this fire jumped the continental divide. If that can't serve as a fire break, what does? And what you're telling us is that it's just a, it's a, it's a lot more complicated than that, and we have to be a lot more sophisticated than that to to think that we're simply going to build fire breaks to to work our way out of this. <clears throat> if one, I may, one thing, oh, go ahead, Monty. I just was going to say, you know, I, I, I do think if you look at what happened with Cameron Peak, the technical solutions that that group of people worked so hard to make worked. And, and it, it, it was scientifically sound, it was well thought out. And even though it wasn't complete, it was enough that that fire was stopped twice. And, um, and, and the place that it blew through, you know, coming out uh, into the Glenhaven area, um, we, we, just, we just weren't that far along. And, and so the thing that, you know, I would, that I would throw out there is that if we're able at a landscape scale to, to take a Cameron Peak and cut it off at 100,000 acres after kind of that uh, last run into Red Feather, but that third run didn't happen. There was 200 and something homes down mm -hmm. in that piece. And so when we start talking about protecting houses, you got to think conversation wise about where, where do you put emphasis? My, my argument is you got to do both. You, you got to do both, but you can't do one in exclusion of the other. And I think that's an important thing for folks to recognize. It's, it's not just if I treat around my house, I'm going to be protected. And we saw that, especially with many of the fires that happened on the West Coast this year in some of those homes or those cities like Paradise and such where fire came down and blew through there. You, 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 you got to think about both. Yeah, thank you for that perspective, Monty. Um, and um, we also know, as, as Russ started us off, that climate contain, continues to be uh, an important factor in all of this. Um, uh, Russ, you, you may have noticed uh, um, that one of our audience members uh, shared an old adage that a forest takes um, seven years to recover from drought, to Monty's point about uh, being fully rehydrated or not. I, I, don't, I don't know what science is, there is behind, behind, behind that, but I do know that, you know, when I was sitting in a, at a Rockies baseball game back in 2002, ash was falling on me um, from, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Heyman fire way back then in 2002. And then in 2012, we had the high peak fire. We had some more fires in 2013, more fires in 2018 and 2020. There does seem to be something cyclical possibly going on here, just anecdotally. Um, I don't know whether that's related to recovery from drought in the forest or not, but but can you share us a little with us a little bit of your perspective on the cyclical nature of things and and is that continuing to build over time and where where do you think we might be headed? Well, so right, I mean we you know there's plenty of history of drought in Colorado and throughout the West. Our our climate is you know is prone to that and to having periods of you know, in, in some cases, multiple years in a row of, um, of dryness. And, you know, certainly within the last 20 years, there's been a pretty strong connection between the drought years and the big fire years, all, you know, those, all those years you mentioned, 2002, 2012, 2018, 2020, were all pretty, uh, pretty significant droughts. Um, so that, you know, that connection is certainly there. Um, you know, going forward into the future, the, you know, the scientific, the research that's been done on this all really points to increased acreage of burning more intense fires in the West as the, the climate continues to warm, basically for these same reasons that we've been talking about, just kind of those, you know, it's, it, it may not be, it's not going to be every year necessarily, but the, the, the number of years where you have these hot, dry conditions in the summer will, uh, you know, will be more frequent primarily because the, the, you know, the hotter it is, the drier it is essentially. So, um, so that's, you know, kind of what it, 
what what most of it's been pointing to. And I think we all got to to witness that firsthand in in you know, I think maybe even a, a, a I mean, a, you know, fire is, has not been my sort of area of research necessarily, but I think just kind of having looked at, at what we've seen over, over time here in Colorado, it, it, this year opened a lot of eyes as to what was even possible, um, you know, and, and we, we know that, you know, it may not be next year or that, or five years from now, but that we're going to have even hotter summers than we had last year as we continue to go forward and we know that dry summers happen here from time to time so the the you know the, the at some point there will be conditions that are that are even more favorable than what we saw last summer um or you know favorable for the fires unfavorable for for all of us thank you for russ um as audience members are quickly understanding we are approaching time. So John and I have a million questions, but I want to try to pull in a couple threads from some audience kind of questions and remarks we have here. Um, and, and, and think about the idea of what's the, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Or, or something along the lines, I probably misspoke on that. But we have, you know, questions in here resolving around commercial logging. Um, around prescribed burns, right? Very much preventative measures, and there's there's many more here. Um, and I would say, you know, what does it mean to to invest money in prevention, not i.e. not necessarily suppression, because we can we can go down that route too, right? But but prevention. Where should we be investing resources? What are we thinking about when it comes to prevention? Some of these things, and you know. Historically, you know, logging is seen as really bad um, in certain eyes and, 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 and turned away. Same thing with prescribed burns. Mo Monty, I see you nodding. What are your thoughts on the role of prevention here um, versus when we have to get to the point of investing in recovery, right? How do we prevent? You, bet. you know, you think about the money that we've spent from a suppression standpoint just on that one fire and now the damages, which are almost as much as we've spent on it. It's, it's unbelievable. How much money that is hundreds of millions of dollars and um and yet the the work and the investment of, of the the amount of money that we've spent to to create what we did was was just a fraction just a small fraction of that and so um i i think there's a lot packed into that question which i'm sure that's the way you did it mm -hmm. uh but but one of the things is is that uh, when when i have worked with environmental groups um, about uh, wondering about why we're doing something. One of the things about what, what I think is happening on the, on the Arapahoe Roosevelt right now is by having strategic vision, there's, there's a, a direct connection between why this thing's happening on the ground and what it creates. So it's easier to see the, 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 the pros and the cons of that decision. The second thing is it's not being done in a back room and then you end up with a letter saying, oh, by the way, next month we're gonna cut and burn all of your, your world. The, the conversation is starting you know, in the community with Jen and, and our fire shed partners around what does this look like? And you know, when, when, when the local VFD ca you know, uh, captain comes and participates, when he goes back to his community and he talks to Bob and Joe as neighbors about the whys and the what's, it makes a difference in terms of they understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I think the strategic vision piece is really critical because you've got to be able to lay it out in ways that people see what's happening and why. And then the social license piece has always been this idea of working with publics and working with people and creating a vision that people can live with in their community that, that also has to be scientifically credible and reasonable and do some good we haven't done that as well as, as we needed to. And, and people like Jen and others, uh, we have other watershed coalitions in on the Arapahoe Roosevelt that are doing the same thing on Boulder and in Gilpin and, um, and other places. They're doing that and they're making this possible for us to have those converse, conversations and involve the public with it. So I'll stop there. Kristen, I know we're running out of time, but I just posted something in the chat the fire shed itself is doing a series of webinars in the next over the next couple of months to dig into like the why we're doing it, how we put prescribed fires together, all the all all of the nuts and bolts that we can't we don't have time to get into here. So people can can tune into those um, over the coming months if they want to learn more about some of that. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to ask one more question that I think is to you before Kristen takes us out, but. Uh, 
I think last week uh, you said something uh, to Kristen and me that I've still been thinking about. And I wonder if you can just say one or two comments about this. And this that your point was that we all need to own the risk associated with forest management and wildfire. Can you say just a word or two about that? Well, um, I mean, I think it gets back to that, what I was talking about earlier about where we each have agency and, a, and space to, to act, um, but we also, we all receive impacts from that risk. And so there's a, a really important conversation to have about what kind of outcomes would we prefer to manage or deal with? And this is sort of what Kristen was alluding to, is it the, do we, are we worried about the risk of a prescribed fire? Or are we worried about the risk from a Cameron Peak fire or an East Troublesome like event? What, what are you more willing to have in your neighborhood? With prescribed fires, there is so much work that goes into planning and mitigating and contingency plans around there, those types of events to really reduce that risk. Um, there's still a lot of fear from communities around that, but really the risk, it's never eliminated, but it's much less than what we have when we have years like 2020. And so I think there's a really important conversation and 2020 is maybe gonna be the springboard for us to have a more fulsome conversation with our communities about what are the outcomes that we wanna see on our landscape and in our communities and downstream of these forested areas. And what do we wanna to do to share in that process, whether it's risk or the implementation part of it. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah, we, I would really love to talk about risk with you all and behavior and living on uncertainty even. I know Russ is the researcher probably has some advice on that too and all of you through your perspectives. Um, uh, thank you for sharing the link for additional resources. Thank you all to our audience for joining us tonight. A huge thank you, of course, to our guests. Jen, Russ, Monty, um, it was a great pleasure getting to talk with you in the weeks leading up to this and tonight. Uh, we covered a lot of ground and we could have stayed on forever. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it was a really nice way to spend um, a Monday evening. Um, as a reminder, we have two more episodes coming up. Same time, same place for the next two Mondays in a row. Uh, Mondays at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Next week, we're going to be talking about, quote unquote, the human element. It is a pretty um, big piece of that, but we're really going to talk about the wildland urban interface a little bit more. We have the mayor for Estes Park joining us. Um, we have an author who embedded herself with firefighters. So talking about those who are literally on the front lines trying to fight these fires when they do come about. Um, and as John mentioned, um, a researcher who works with the Hemez Pueblo. So a diverse setup and lineup for next Monday, um, next week. So we hopefully see you all there. Um, Nicole dropped in a ton of resources and links for you all. We will send up a follow-up email as well with a link to the recording um, and maybe some additional reading resources um, based on what our speakers have been talking about and some of the work that we do. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And huge thank you to John um, and the Center for Collaborative Conservation. It's such a pleasure to partner with them and all of our other partners. Uh, and of course, thank you to Gates Family Foundation for helping us sponsor um, this webinar series. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.